The test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a telephone conversation about opening a bank account. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Expats Helpline, Terry Davies here. What can I do for you? Hello, Terry. I've been in this country for a while and I've just been offered a job in the city, so I think I'm going to need to open a bank account. I haven't had one before, so I'm wondering what papers I need. Well, basically you'll need to be able to prove to the bank that you're who you say you are and that you live where you say you do, okay? Uh-huh. And for some banks, at least, that means you'll have to show them two separate pieces of identity. So I'll run through the list if you like. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. I'll bring it up on the screen. Let's see. Here it is. Right. The first thing it says is a valid passport. Mine's Australian. Yes, that would be fine, of course. The next one is a driving license. And again, one from your country would be okay. Then that's followed by birth certificate. Oh, hang on. That's only if you're under 18. Which I'm not. Right. So not that then. But you can also show them a benefit book. For instance, if you're in ill health, or unemployed, or getting income support? Yes, I could bring that. Or a letter from my employer, maybe? Well, that's not actually on the list, so we'll have to assume you can't. Okay. And to prove where I live? Again, there are several possible things listed here. For instance, you could use a bill for council tax, or something else for where you live, such as an insurance certificate. I've got one of those, somewhere among all my papers. But what about bills? Things like phone bills, I mean. As long as it has your address on it, yes. Fine. So a bill for my mobile would do, would it? Uh, I'm afraid it would have to be for a fixed line phone. You could use other types of household bill, though, as long as you get them through the post. How about an electricity bill? That'll say where I live, won't it? If it's in your name and not that of a landlord, yes. It is, so I'll probably take that then. There's one other you might want to use, a vehicle registration document. If you have a car or motorbike or something, of course. No, I haven't, actually. Now, I believe there's a bank actually inside the commercial centre, and I might open an account there, seeing as how that's where I'll be every day. Yeah, that would seem to make sense. I know people who bank there. I actually read about it in a city guide. My cousin picked it up when he was here a couple of years ago, and I made a few notes. Do you mind if I run through them with you now, just to make sure the details haven't changed? Fine, go ahead. OK, first question. It's still a branch of the Popular Bank, is it? The one with links to Australian banks? No, it's actually been taken over by another big banking group, the Savings Bank. It still seems quite popular, though, especially with people doing business in the Asia-Pacific area. Mm. And when is it open? Monday to Saturday? I'll have to check their website for that. Give me a second or two, will you? Sure. Right. I've got it. Customer service, and it's... just weekdays, I'm afraid. Mm. Does it say what their business hours are? I'm just looking for that. It's on a different page for some reason. I think there's been a change at some banks in the last year or so. Yeah, here it is. It's open from 9.30 in the morning till half past three in the afternoon. And it's on the top floor of the main centre building, is it, next to the travel agency? That's where it used to be, but they've since moved it to a slightly bigger place. It's on the ground floor now. Oh. 
And one last thing on this. Um, I know most banks give incentives to young people to open accounts with them, but apparently this one didn't. Do you know if they're offering anything these days? I'll just check. I'm sure they'd say so on their new clients page if they were. No, there's nothing mentioned here. Oh, that's a pity. I was quite looking forward to getting my free gift. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. There are plenty of other banks within walking distance, you know. It may be worth shopping around to see what they've got to offer. Longer opening hours, including Saturdays, perhaps less crowded. Can you tell me how to get to a couple of them? I know where the commercial centre is, so that's probably my best starting place. Sure. For the Royal Bank, you need to turn left when you leave the centre, Go along Market Street past the post office and turn left up Bridge Street past the Shaw Theatre. Mm. Then you take the first right. You'll see an internet cafe on the other side and the Royal is just a bit further along on the right, directly opposite the Park Hotel. Okay, I've got that. Um, what about the Northern Bank? For that one, you turn right as you come out of the centre and go along Market Street until you come to the junction with West Street. Mm. There you turn right again and carry on up as far as the next junction where you take a left. You'll see the bank from there. It's the third building on the right. Fine. And the last one, uh, the National Bank? You can go either way from the centre, really. Up West Street or Bridge Street and then along past City Hall. The bank is on the other side of the road, right next to the tourist office. You can't miss it. Great. Thanks a lot for your help. Any time. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear the director of the Leadership Council give his welcome address at a convention. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention please? Please find your seats. Snacks will be available all day long. Thank you. Allow me to first introduce myself. I am Joe Steinke, Director of the Leadership Council. On behalf of the Organizing Committee for the 8th Annual Leadership Conference, I welcome you all to San Dimas, California, for a special session on postmodern solutions. We have people attending from as far away as Toronto, New York, and even the Bahamas. Frankly, I wish we had gone to you there. <laughs> but we're very glad you're all here. Let me say further that this will be our largest conference yet. Registrations have far surpassed our expectations. For the first three days, 
we will be hosting more than 325 participants for lectures and workshops. Another 100 will be joining us for our final two days and culminating session on Friday evening. We also have a larger selection of seminars than ever, a total of 32. Because we know that you all will want to attend a few special sessions, we will repeat key seminars each day. So there will actually be 38 sessions. I'm sure you will all be pleased with the content and the quality of speakers. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, for those who have opted not to take part in our bag lunches, there are a number of places nearby that we can recommend. We are located here in the convention center just across the street from the Harford Shopping Mall, and the place we most recommend is Vital's, which is just west across Queen Street on the opposite corner. Please be careful crossing both streets, however, as we don't want to lose any participants. <laughs> if you're not up to Vital's, you can also get some Italian food at the Olive Garden, which is further down Queen Street and east on Danning Avenue, across from the police station. They have a great minestrone soup and excellent breadsticks, all you can eat. On the other hand, if you want some good old American food, you can head to Fuddruckers for some big hamburgers or to the cattle company for some fat, juicy steak. Fuddruckers is next to the Olive Garden, but the cattle company is back closer to us in the opposite direction of Vital's. Just go east out of the convention center across King Street. It's on the same side as the convention center, so you just have one street to cross. Enjoy. But also, please make sure you are back for the afternoon sessions. These will always start at 1.30 p.m. That will give you an hour and a half for lunch each day. Sessions will be over each day at 5.30. Now, regarding the schedules we've printed out, there have been a couple of last-minute changes. The session titled New Leadership Strategies will no longer be held in Seminar Room 1, but in the main ballroom. This session has garnered much praise and is highly recommended to all, hence the change to a larger room. Another session has been canceled. That session was titled Leading by Serving, and it was scheduled for Daniel's room. The speaker for that session, Dr. Mark Green, had to return home for some urgent health situation. We wish the best to Dr. Green and that all is fine with his family. Finally, the session titled Using the Arts and Media has been changed to the second lounge room, Lounge 2. Please show up promptly for sessions and sit towards the front of each room so that all seats can be utilized. Also, turn off all pagers, beepers, and cell phones. Drinks and snacks will be provided outside each room, but please be careful at your tables. Enjoy the conference. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk by a wildlife specialist on a type of bird called a kiwi. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Auckland Zoo on this sunny Sunday afternoon and to our special Kiwi fundraising event. My job is to tell you all about the amazing little Kiwi and your job, hopefully, is to dig deep in your pockets. <laughs> Now, for the benefit of our overseas visitors here today, I should explain first of all that the kiwi is the national bird of New Zealand, and sometimes New Zealanders themselves are known as kiwis. Now, while kiwis in the wild are a rare sight, the kiwi as a symbol is far more visible. Apart from being in toy stores and airport shops all over the world, you'll find them on our stamps and coins. The kiwi is the smallest member of the genus Apteryx, which also includes ostriches and emu. It gets its name from its shrill call, which sounds very much like this. Kiwi! Kiwi! Kiwis live in forests or swamps and feed on insects, worms, snails and berries. It's a nocturnal bird with limited sight and therefore it has to rely on its very keen sense of smell to find food and to sense danger. Its nostrils are actually right on the end of its long beak, which is one third of the body length. Now, here's an interesting fact. Although kiwis have wings, they serve little purpose because the kiwi is a flightless bird. Since white settlement of the islands, kiwi numbers have dropped from 12 million to less than 70,000. And our national bird is rapidly becoming an endangered species. This is because they're being threatened by what we call introduced animals. Animals which were brought to New Zealand, such as cats and ferrets, which eat kiwi eggs and their chicks. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And so we have launched the Kiwi Recovery Programme in an all-out effort to save our national bird from extinction. There are three stages to this programme. Firstly, we have the scientific research stage. This involves research to find out more about what Kiwis need to survive in the wild. Then secondly, we have the action stage. This is where we go into the field and actually put our knowledge to work. We call this putting science into practice. And then we come to the third stage, the global education stage. By working with schools and groups like yourself, as well as through our award-winning Kiwi website, we are hoping to educate people about the plight of the Kiwi. As part of the action stage, which I just mentioned, we've introduced Operation Nest Egg, and this is where your money will be going. It works like this. It's a three-stage process. First of all, 
We go out to the kiwi's natural habitat and we collect kiwi eggs. This is the tricky part, because it can be very difficult to find the eggs. Then, in safe surroundings, away from predators, the chicks are reared. Now, this can be done on predator-free islands or in captivity. They're reared until they're about nine months old, at which stage the chicks are returned to the wild. So far, it's proving successful. And since we started the program, some 34 chicks have been successfully raised this year, and their chances of survival have increased from 5 to 85 per cent. However, it's not time to celebrate kiwi survival just yet. About 95 per cent of kiwi chicks still don't make it to six months of age without protection. Which is why Operation Nest Egg is so important. And we ask you to give generously today. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the continuation of the lecture about the human brain. Look at the diagram before you listen. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. OK, we have looked at the top view of the brain and seen how it is divided into lobes. Now we are going to look at a more complex diagram of the centre of the brain. I will briefly go through some of the important parts that make up the brain and then talk more about what each does. First of all, you can see that by far the largest part of the brain is the cerebrum and it is made up of the three lobes we have already talked about. The lobe below, coloured yellow on the diagram here, is the cerebellum. Right in the centre of the brain here is the thalamus. The hypothalamus is part of it but it has a slightly different function now here, running down from the centre of the brain, is the brain stem. It is made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, and is connected to the spinal cord, which you can see here at the bottom of the diagram. Now, finally, this little gland just to the left of the midbrain, it looks like a little tail, is the pituitary gland. OK, let's go back and say something about the function of the various parts of the brain. The cerebrum, the largest part, as we have said, has two halves or hemispheres. I will talk more about the difference between the two hemispheres later. The cerebrum is the part of the brain that is really our intelligence. It controls voluntary movement that is, movement that we are in control of, speaking, for example. But it is also responsible for our emotional thinking and memory. The cerebellum is responsible for fine movement and coordination, 
It helps us with balance, for example, and to understand where we are. In relation to space around us. The thalamus, here in the centre, processes what we feel with our body, touch and temperature, for example, and controls how we react to those senses. The hypothalamus has a similar function, but regulates bodily needs, such as hunger and thirst, and tells us when we need sleep. Now, at the top of the brain stem is the midbrain. This is a sort of switchboard, a very complex switchboard. It sends messages which help the brain communicate with other parts of the nervous system. The pons in the middle of the brain stem here sends messages from the cerebrum to the cerebellum and spinal cord. The medulla oblongata is here just above the spinal cord. It regulates essential bodily functions, like breathing and the rate of our heartbeat. The spinal cord is part of the central nervous system and runs down inside the spinal column. It connects the brain to nerves that go to the rest of the body. Now, the pituitary gland, this little gland, has a hugely important function. It releases hormones to the body that regulate all sorts of things. How quickly we grow, and the size we grow to, the rate at which we age. It also regulates whether we have a slow or fast metabolism and how we relate to stress. Now I am going to show you a model of the human brain and I want you to identify... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.